Please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless, and at that time told no one what they had seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ms. Pat. This is God's holy word for us today, Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday. It is right before the beginning of Lent, and it's important to start off on the Lenten journey with the affirmation of who Christ is and what he's done for us and why he was sent to the world. The beginning of that passage is, is so critical. It says eight days later. So you have to jump back and go, well, what happened eight days ago? I need to know what was said. You look earlier in the text in Luke and you've got this exchange where Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? Right? And Peter had answered correctly. God's Messiah, the Christ whom God has sent. And after that, Jesus predicts for them his death. And this is critical because you remember they, they really didn't know what was going to happen or how this was going to work. We have the benefit of hindsight and the record book before us, but the disciples were living in to this reality. So here Jesus is talking about how you would have to suffer and be rejected, killed, and then he would rise on the third day. He goes on to say that part of scripture that many of us have tried to live into so often. Anyone who wants to come after me must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will save them. It's part of our process as Christ followers to learn to lean in and live in to those words and part of the Lenten journey to figure out how to deny ourselves and follow Christ more carefully and more perfectly. So this exchange should happen. Peter affirms who Jesus is, and then eight days later, this transfiguration moment, where they go up on the mountainside and God uses the moment to confirm the divinity of Jesus and the purpose of his life on earth. He confirms that Jesus is set to fulfill the law that Moses declared through God and the prophet's words that God gave to the prophets. That Jesus has come to fulfill both of those things that, that the faith and the people who knew and loved God would anticipate as God's holy word. He was making Jesus his holy word incarnate in flesh. But in this moment, Jesus' face is going bright white and it's brilliant. And Elijah and Moses, like Miss Debbie said, long since gone, have appeared. And Peter and James and John, there's this sense of they're sleepy or maybe they're rubbing their eyes like, is this really real? Is this really happening right now? And in the midst of that, the clothes that they're all wearing, Elijah and Moses and Jesus turn bright white. So there's this advancing brightness and brilliance of God's light coming upon them. And the transfiguration transpires. So Peter, I love Peter so much. 
And Peter's willingness in his mind, go, this is so amazing. We're going to need to make this place permanent. Put up a shrine. Let's pitch a tent. Let's never leave this mountaintop experience. And he's expressing this thought to Jesus when then there is even more bright light and it's overshadowed them and overcome them. And they were speechless. I want to take you to the shore of Galilee and it is good for me to go back to those trips to the Holy Land time and again. But this particular instance, I was standing at the shore of the Sea of Galilee next to the Peter, Peter's church, Peter's primacy, where the rock is, where Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church, you, Peter. So they have made a shrine, right? A place of permanence to remember that. But on the shore that morning, I was standing with my toes at the edge of the water. I was actually looking for a seashell to swipe and take home. <laughs> but I was looking out and I looked up and this fog had come down to the point where it had rested on the water and the morning light was shining through the clouds, but he couldn't see, I couldn't differentiate between water and sky. There was nothing but this, this bright kind of grayish light as far as I could see, nothing in front of me, no ground. You know, in a normal fog, you can see some ground 20, 30, 50 yards in front of you. But on the water and the reflection, there was nothing but light. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder if this is what it was like to stand in the full, glorious presence of God. What would you say? What would you say if you were Peter, James, or John? What kind of questions would go through your head? This speechless sense had come upon you and this question and rubbing your eyes like, what is happening? I need to fast forward from that mountaintop to 1962 in New York City at an advertising agency. It's a, it's a leap, but it's okay. There's an advertiser named, his name was Martin Spector. And he wanted to find some punctuation that would bring together two important parts of speech for the, for the world so that he could put in his ads that rhetorical question that was also excited. It cleans and disinfects. It shines and polishes, right? The exclamation point and question mark. He put a challenge out there to advertisers and typesetters. Can you come up with a new punctuation that would bring this rhetorical excited question together once and for all? And the winning punctuation looked like this. The interrobang. It brings together, though, this sense of all good things question and all good things excitement. And it was first called the quiz ding, the explorative, or the exclamaquest. So they settled on interrobang, but still it didn't tip points and become an actual punctuation mark. It's a mystery because how many of you like me fill your text messages and emails with what's happening? Question mark, exclamation point. Really? Question mark, exclamation point, exclamation point, question mark. I need that in my emoji lineup. The intero bang is missing from my typing. Just know if you get a text from me and I've done that, I'm thinking intero bang. <laughs> it is the punctuation of my life. But that's what the, the question, exclamation point that I've got in my sense of where Peter is in this moment, where he's going, is this really happening? Is this real? What does this mean? What can we do to go forward from this moment? But he's speechless. Some events are precious in their nature because they simply are so amazing and strike such awe in us that we don't have the words. There are moments that leave us overwhelmed. And there are moments of the mysterious nature of God that intersects with our life and we just get to go, that was so amazing. And we just don't have the words. 
Maybe it was the first time you were in a church and the singing was so great and the swell of the music was so profound that you were lifted off your feet by the Spirit and you felt the presence of God. Maybe it was when you were baptized or saw your child baptized and you felt that you were standing in the presence of God. Some events are so precious in their nature because they simply will not ever come around again. For some reason, that notion brought up in me the memory of going to a baseball game in Texas and I was there just enjoying the garlic Parmesan fries when everyone started to surround me with their cheers and, and accolade and they were just on their feet and the music was playing and Sammy Sosa had just hit his 600th home run. And they were excited and I was speechless. Go, what in the world? <laughs> but understanding it wasn't gonna come again, right? An achievement, a moment, it was fun. This most closely makes me feel though what it felt like when I climbed the first 14,000 foot peak in Colorado and I was in college and I got to the top and I looked around and I was like, I'm on top of the world. And, and it was the most beautiful place to be and the most incredible vision. And I didn't have words. That moment would never come again. It's precious in its silence. Some moments are so astounding. They're it's just amazing what we're capable of. Astronauts landing on the moon, right? There's some moments that are so disastrous, words escape us when we see the devastation from a tsunami or a, an, an F5 tornado. Some events produce no words because they're just precious and never will come around again. One of the examples of that was uh, Miss Debbie told me, Caitlin, this great story. So, so Caitlin had, had just delivered Charlie, Debbie's first grandchild, right? Beautiful baby Charlie. And Caitlin's mom was so generous of spirit, having already had a grandchild, turned to Debbie and said, you, hold, you be the first grandparent to hold Charlie because this moment will never come again, right? It was so sweet and graceful and wonderful for her to have that opportunity. Debbie said, I grabbed that baby and I was so overcome with emotion, I didn't have words. Maybe all who have grandchildren, you've been there, or just the first time you held your own child, that feeling of amazing love, amazing love. But there are some events that produce no words because there aren't words in the human language to express the depth of grief and anguish that all you have in response to pain and suffering is a lament, a wail that comes from the bottom of your soul and escapes your body in just an agonizing sound. Tragedy, loss of life too soon, another school shooting, or just the sense of hopelessness. This week, as the United Methodist Church met in its general conference to determine a way forward on human sexuality, I admit that watching it live stream and, and the reactions and the decisions being made left me speechless in a lot of ways. I said it, it's like watching divorce court and watching people not, not get along and, and differ on perspectives of what the Bible says and who we are and what kind of love there should be. And watching the body divided and, and the emotional pull apart and the frustration that comes just in the event itself of votes and Robert's Rules of Order and politicking and stonewalling and feeling frustrated and left with a sense of pain and conflict and a sense of what it's like for the LGBTQ community and for our brothers and sisters in the Methodist Church around the world, just knowing that what was or wasn't accomplished just left me with no words. There are many human experiences where we find ourselves at a temporary loss of words. In the transfiguration story in Mark, in Mark's gospel, it says they were told, don't, don't tell anyone that this has happened. In Luke's gospel, Peter's trying to do something, but the, the overwhelming light silences him, and then they leave the mountain without a word being spoken by Jesus or Peter. Only God speaks. 
but they go down the mountain. They probably end up telling the story you heard. It says they were speechless until another time, and that was probably after the resurrection when, when Jesus would come again and the post-resurrection appearances, and then they go, oh, now we can tell you it makes total sense, this event on the mountain. The amazement that they felt matches our human experience. Luke often writes in the Gospel of Luke words about fear and amazement and wonder, which of course would be our response to the events of God entering our world in the life of Jesus and his miracles and his healings and his sense of love and inclusion. Remember how when Mary was, was there with Jesus and Joseph and he'd been born and the, the angels had appeared to the shepherds and this great heavenly of hosts and proclaimed the good news. And then the shepherds went with haste and saw Mary and Joseph and Jesus and they went from there and told the whole world that was, they were amazed and you have to come see what has happened. But it said Mary pondered them in her heart. Two responses, right? One silent and one exclamation point, cheerleading, praise God, glory be. Both are appropriate responses. Wonder and amazement and proclaiming the good news. Silence is a part of our response to the work and the presence of God all the time. Silence may mean the absence of words and it may mean the presence of meanings that are too deep for words. So that the silence is fruitful, where, where we think every great word that comes after it has come after a time of deliberation and compelling silence, where out of the depth of our experience, we're finally ready to proclaim something new, but that silence allowed something new to grow within. Justin, my husband, tells a story when he was a child, like five years old in kindergarten, it was time to grow seeds in styrofoam cups. And you put the seed in the cup and the dirt on the seed and you put it on the table and you water it and you wait for it to grow. And he would come in every day and shake out that seed on the table and go, why isn't it growing? And put the seed back in the cup and put it back on the table, come in the next day, shake out the seed, part the, part the dirt, why isn't it growing? Until the teacher, after several days of this, said, let's just put it up here and give it time to think about it. Give it space. And so the waiting and the silence and the wondering, can't see it, what's happening, gave it time to germinate and grow. Out of some of those experiences where you can't just see it and make it happen, you have to wait for it in the silence and the patience. Jesus' face was shining and his clothes were bright white and the three of them, they're there and they're amazing heavenly splendor. And Peter was pitching tents in his mind and expressing the idea to Jesus when the, the shadow overwhelmed them. And then there's this interrobang moment. What does this mean? And then God spoke, came through the light, the voice of God, this is my son, the chosen one, listen to him. It's a reminder for us, this whole message boils down to it, that God says, this is my son, Jesus. God speaks to the world, defining who Jesus is. My son sent to the world, right? That whosoever shall believe in him shall not die, but have eternal life. It's God speaking the confirmation of Jesus to the world. And then it says, listen to him. So we understand from that, that Jesus speaks. And so he does through all of the gospels, speaking about come and follow me. Do not be afraid. Take up your cross. Love thy neighbor. Your sins are forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. And today you will be with me in paradise. He speaks and all we have to do is listen to him. Where Peter's response was wrong in the sense that he wanted to build a place of permanence and shrines and monuments to the moment and come back to that mountaintop all the time. The truth is that the only thing that's permanent in this world is the memory we have and the memory that we pass on and the words of God that are permanent in this book, in the record of these things. 
There's no monument that can withstand all of Mother Nature. There's no permanent structure that is actually permanent. All things waste away. But the record is permanent. The story is before us. The words of God live on as we share them and speak them, meditate on them and let them germinate and grow in our lives until we speak them again. The permanence of the story of Jesus is his teachings for all generations, for the helps and the hopes, for the faithful and the faith-filled people to know about love and healing and renewal and redemption. The promise and the place of permanence for Jesus is that we treasure them in our hearts. We are the place of permanence when we keep true in our hearts who Jesus is, what he did for us, and to share that good news. From out of our response, we only need to remember that God speaks, Jesus speaks, and we need to listen. God has sent Jesus to the world in full glory and power and asks only that we listen to him and that we be silent, silence our distractions, silence our minds, silence our responses, and just live in the glory until the words can come out again. Thank you, Lord. Praise be to God. How can it be that you, my king, would die for me? Amazing love. Until finally, we say the words at the heavenly banquet, where all are welcome at the table, where God has put a place for all, where we join together at the table and say, thanks be to God. It is the day of celebrating Jesus' gift in his, in his communion with us. We asked to come to the table having first made a confession of our, our sins and looking to be reconciled to God. We offer our confession and prayer, acknowledging what it is that we've done or where we've been led astray or what our temptations are that we cannot seem to shake. But in our confession, we may find the confidence of the pardon and the gift of God's grace again at the table. So friends, prepare your hearts to receive these gifts from Jesus Christ by making your confession. Let us be in a time of silent prayer. So let the, the word of God speak through your heart. Let us pray. Lord God, we do confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts and we have failed to be an obedient church and we have failed to do your will. So Lord, where we fall and fall short, will you build us up? Will you carry us the rest of the way? Will you pour out your grace upon us again so that we feel and know and receive that grace and accept that forgiveness so that we may move forward justified in that grace and move on in sanctification, in leading lives worthy and holy and caring for one another in Christian love. It is the good news that Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. My friends, on the night before he was betrayed and arrested, beaten and crucified. Jesus sat with his disciples and he took the bread and he took what was ordinary and usual and he gave thanks and he prayed over it and he said, this is my body. It is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And though they may not have fully understood what he was saying, he took the cup and again gave thanks and he gave it to the disciples. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you're together, do this in remembrance of me. And so it is that we've come to this church. 
We've come to be in fellowship and in Christian love with one another, looking for Jesus and listening to his words and trying to live into his command to love our neighbors and to hear the cry of the needy and to offer each other forgiveness and grace and to grow in our faith. We remember his miracles, his teachings, his inclusion of the least and the last and the lost. And that he asked us to remember him in this way. And so, my friends, we ask that the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you come upon these gifts of the bread and the fruit of the vine. And that you make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That in taking and receiving them, we will be transformed from the inside out. We will be encouraged by the presence of Christ within us to go out into the world and to be the hands and feet of Christ, to share God's love, to encourage others around us, to be his light in the darkness. Thank you for these gifts that make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at the heavenly banquet. We confirm this in our faith that we know that Christ has died and Christ has risen and that Christ will come again. May we join our voices together to say the words that Jesus taught disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.